Good morning, and welcome to this beautiful, I want to say September still, but this beautiful uh, October service of worship here at Beacon. It is a glorious day out there. We invite you all to remember in your prayers all those who are named in our prayer jar, as well as all of those who we name in our hearts, in our prayers as we go through this week. Salvation Army is now taking appointments for families who are seeking help at Christmas time through the Christmas hamper program. And if you do know anyone who could use that assistant, please uh, get in touch with them and ask them to submit their information to uh, Kathy Moley at the Salvation Army. And they have up until November 26th to submit their names. And so Sharon's baby project is ready to launch. How well do you know the people in your congregation? So the baby photos are now prepared. Uh, they're posted on the bulletin board out by the entry to the courtyard. And it's going to cost you for five bucks. You can. Get. And the challenge is who can get the most of those B pictures correctly identified. Uh, the person who gets the most correct will receive a box of two dozen handmade truffles. The second prize is one dozen handmade truffles. And the names who got the photos posted will make it a little easier. So uh, if in the unlikely chance that anyone gets all 20 correct, they get five dozen handmade truffles. That's like all your Christmas baking out of the way. So uh, you can get entry forms from Reverend Sharon in different ways. Uh, you can get a printed copy of the form, or you can send in your email and she can send you a copy of the form and the pictures. And she tells me that if you do that, the pictures that you get through your email are really much clearer than the ones that are posted on the bulletin board. Uh, the contest closes November 20th, and we'll be announcing winners on November 22nd. So um, there's a challenge. And I have a sign up sheet. Oops. Sorry. Can't hear me? Maybe if I take my mask off, it would help too. Okay. I have sign up, a sign up sheet that you can put your name. If you want a paper form, we put a check there. If you want an email, you put a check there. But this is the box that says paid. <laughs> and I'm not going to send you an email with the information until this box is checked. Thank you, Reverend Sharon. It'll be a fun, a fun challenge for us all. I think that's all of the announcements for this morning. Ah, okay. So a concert this afternoon at Beacon Park. And... I'm not sure if it was divine intervention or what happened, but I know Gene Solos was supposed to leave us here last week, but he's here again this morning. Unfortunately for him, it's because of a vehicle problem and he has to stay until it's repaired. Fortunately for us, we get to hear him again. So thanks, Gene, for being here. The concert today is at 2, is that right, Nancy? 2.30 at Beacon Park. Moonlight Swing Band. And with that, I invite you to greet your neighbor with a wave and the peace of Christ. Whenever we light our Christ candle, we remember the light of Christ. We remember that it's not limited to this space or this time. The light of Christ is everywhere. So as we light this candle, let us remember that we are challenged to not only recognize Christ's light wherever it shines, but to take that light with us and shine it for all the world. wherever we are in this beautiful province. 
We are reminded that we gather on lands that are by law, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We gratefully and respectfully acknowledge this. We also respectfully honor their traditions and spirituality, along with the spirituality and traditions of the Métis peoples with whom we share this land. Our call to worship this morning is adapted from a 2012 United Church of Canada resource called What is Creation Saying to Us? Depend on me. Inside a tree, spirit speaks. Through bark and seed, through creature and breath, a thousand songs in the forest whisper, we are one. Inside a river, spirit sings. Through stone and fish, through motion and thirst. A thousand sounds beat in the ocean, whispering, we are one. Inside the very atmosphere that surrounds us, spirit soars. Through wings and winds, through gentle night skies and fierce winter storms. A thousand dreams circle the sky, whispering, we are one. Inside us, our seed, breath, thirst, storm, brilliance. How can we not nourish that which is simply us in a different form. How can we hear creation above the din of our lives, whispering to us, we are one? We come to worship the great spirit, the divine creator, inseparable from all, inseparable from us. We come to worship the one who reminds us we are one. Let us pray. God, you created the world with your dream of what it could be. You dreamed of people and plants, animals and land, air and water, all living in right relationship with you and with each other. Today, we offer you our dream for a world which is not threatened by the changing climate, which hurts our atmosphere, which wounds the poorest and most vulnerable, which leaves this wonderful planet in poor shape for future generations. Help us to listen to your voice, your dream, and your creation. Help us to recognize that we are part of that creation and help us to become part of your dream. Amen. That prayer was written by the Catholic Coalition for Climate Change. And as we have been doing, throughout our creation series, our theme conversation will be a video, this time titled Sky.
Look up. There I am. I am the sky. I am a warm, protective blanket. Look up. There I am. I am the sky. I am a warm, protective blanket wrapped around everyone on Earth. I can bring clouds, rain, and wind. I can be an ice storm. Without me, you'd fry. Every day, I am the breath you take in. Yet you are making me sick. I am congested, off balance, polluted. You see, I am more delicate than you think. It took millions of years to get it just right. My perfect mix of gases, temperature, and weather that you enjoy. But now your cars, your factories, and dust, they have pushed me past the limit. And you wonder why my typhoons and tornadoes are more intense, more frequent. I have become unpredictable. Less rain here, a lot more rain here. Hotter summers, colder winters. I cannot even control myself anymore. Enough about me. I will show my changing self to you in your days ahead. But in the end, I'll be fine. Give me a few thousand years. I have weathered trauma before. I am not worried for myself. Look up. Although we don't always think about climate change as being a topic we might find in the Bible, the following passage from the book of the prophet Isaiah almost sent a shiver down my spine when I read it. To me, it reflects very strongly our current situation. Isaiah 24, 4 through 13. The earth dries up and withers. The whole world grows weak. Both earth and sky decay. The people have defiled the earth by breaking God's laws and by violating the covenant he made to last forever. So God has pronounced a curse on the earth. Its people are paying for what they have done. Fewer and fewer remain alive. The grapevines wither and the wine is becoming scarce. Everyone who was once happy is now sad, and the joyful music of their harps and drums has ceased. There is no more happy singing over wine. No one enjoys its taste anymore. In the city, everything is in chaos, and people lock themselves in their houses for safety. People shout in the streets because there is no more wine. Happiness is gone forever. It has been banished from the land. The city is in ruins, 
and its gates have been broken down. This is what will happen in every nation all over the world. It will be like the end of the harvest, when the olives have been beaten off every tree and the last grapes picked from the vine. Psalm readings that I've been using over the past few months as we've looked at creation have been taken from the Good News Translation Bible. But today, I'm using the version that appears in our Voices United hymn book instead. I chose to do that because Voices United combines Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 in a way that seems to reflect today's theme much better than any individual psalm does. For me, the reading reminds us that we all share responsibility for what is happening to our earth, and that all of us, regardless of how hard we might think we are not doing it, are contributing to climate change. When you listen to the words of this psalm, think about the poor and abused not only as people, but also as creation itself. The foolish have spoken in their heart and said, there is not God, they are corrupt. They do abominable things. There is no one who does what is good. God looks down from heaven upon us all to see if any are wise and seek after God but all have gone astray. All alike are corrupted. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those who do evil? They devour my people like so much bread and do not pray to God. But see, they, they will tremble with fear for God is on the side of righteousness. Do not mock the hope of the poor for God is their refuge. All that deliverance of, of, or God's people would come forth from Zion. When God restores the fortunes of the people, then shall Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. The letter to the Romans talks about the suffering of creation, but it also holds on to the hope that creation will one day be set free from its slavery to decay. It will enjoy equal status as the children of God. It also reminds us that this hope is not about what we know, but about what we dream may be possible. Romans 8, 18 through 25. I consider that what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that is going to be re revealed to us. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. For creation was condemned to lose its purpose. Yet there was hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know what up to the present time all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. But it is not just creation alone which groans. We who have the Spirit as the first of God's gifts also groan within ourselves as we wait for God to make us his children and set our whole world whole being free. For it is by hope that we were saved. But we see what we hope for then it is not really hope. For who of us hopes for something we see, but if we hope for what we do not see, we will wait for it with patience. Our gospel reading this morning may seem like a very odd choice. It is the gospel reading that was recommended in the material. When I first read it, I dismissed it as being, where did that come from? But the more I thought about it, the more I realized there is a connection. This is Mark's story of the resurrection. Perhaps the connection between the two, resurrection and creation, is believing in the impossible. 
both the story of resurrection and the battle against climate change can be very frightening, but both demand that if we truly believe, we must take action. Mark 16, one through eight. After the, after the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Solomon, brought spices to go and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on Sunday morning at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they said to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Because it was a very large stone. Then they looked up and saw that the stone had already been rolled back. So they entered the tomb where they saw a young man sitting at, at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised. Look, here is the place where he was placed. Now go and give this message to his disciples, including Peter. He is going to Galilee, ahead of you. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and ran from the tomb, distressed and terrified. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. American environmentalist Bill McKibben is quoted as saying this, I've mostly given up on being either optimistic or pessimistic. Our odds of success are not incredibly good. But I wake up each day saying, what can I do to change those odds a little? And it's not impossible, the task that we have ahead. We're not going to stop global warming, but slowing it to the point where we can cope with it remains within the realm of possibility. Fun is not quite the right word, but there's something deeply satisfying about trying. It's the biggest challenge that humans have ever got to take part in. It's exciting to be part of that, to be doing something that crucial is a great honor. Climate change is now making us realize that we are in danger of destroying the very foundation of God's creation. We have to see that we must care for God's creation, and that is what God commands us to do. The problem has been that until recently, many people refuse to recognize or admit that we are damaging the world's ecosystems through our modern industrial lifestyle. Despite the fact that it is now clear that we are at an extremely critical point in our lives, some people still refuse to believe. This planet is our only home. Life on this planet is a miracle in itself in part, or possibly only, because of a thin layer of atmosphere that surrounds the Earth. It contains just the right mixture of gases to maintain a life-supporting temperature. If there was more oxygen or more carbon dioxide, life as we know it would not be possible. But we are disrupting this balance. Coal and oil combustion release carbon dioxide, 
which is trapped in the earth for millions of years. When we burn fossil fuels, we are using the resources of the past, but in doing so, we are threatening the future. Carbon dioxide levels are now higher than they have ever been at any time in the past 650,000 years. We have to reduce our production of CO2 dramatically. Now this does not mean that we have to abandon our way of life or return to a pre-industrial society. It does mean that we have to, to generate energy in ways that do not damage the atmosphere. We will have to live in harmony with the laws of the universe. This will require using renewable energy sources. The sun produces 6,000 times more energy than we need at any given time. And the sun is not the only source of renewable energy. Natural sources of energy such as solar, wind, tidal, wave, and hydro are all being harnessed today. As Christians, we are not only obligated to respond to God's mandate to care for God's creation, but we must also be willing to put what we say we believe into action. Being willing to live more simply so that others of this and future generations may simply live. We can do this by seeking to live in harmony, not only with God's creation, but also with one another. The economic injustice of our present day world are destroying any possibility of a sustainable world in the future. There will be no peace until there is a more equitable sharing of and caring for natural resources. Climate justice is a deeply moral issue. If exploitation of fossil fuels, the exploitation of fossil fuels produces vast wealth and power, but it also is driving us towards destruction. And carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas that humans are releasing into our atmosphere. Methane, the natural byproduct of decomposition, is a far more active greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Although it is much less abundant in the atmosphere, massive landfills, huge factory farms, especially cattle farms and rice cultivation, are now releasing methane into the atmosphere in record levels. Nitrous oxide, a powerful greenhouse gas, is produced by soil cultivation practices. And it is also increasing, mainly because of the use of commercial or organic fertilizers, fossil fuel combustion, including farm equipment, nitric oxide production, and the burning of organic matter. Chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, are synthetic compounds entirely of industrial origin. They're now largely banned in the developing world because of their proven destructive effect on the ozone layer. Our atmosphere is a fine balance that we humans are risking upsetting or even destroying. Do you realize that 78% of the air that you breathe is nitrogen? 21% is oxygen. 
and the remainder is made up mainly of water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, helium, air argon, neon, and a few others. But if there were only 4% more oxygen in our atmosphere, paper, wood, and other flammable materials would spontaneously burst into flame. And if there were no carbon dioxide at all, our planet would be a frozen wasteland. As atmospheric greenhouse gases increase, so does the temperature of our Earth. But the effects of global warming are not distributed evenly around the world. It is often the poorest countries that are hit the hardest. And the effects of global warming are not necessarily things that you would associate with global warming. Everyone seems to understand that as the oceans warm, polar ice caps are melting and sea levels are rising, which threatens low-lying cities, coastal development, and farmlands. But warming oceans also change ocean currents, causing weather, weather patterns to shift, resulting in both heat waves and cold spells, increased flooding, and increased drought as well as frequent and more severe storms, including hurricanes, tornadoes, and typhoons. Increased average temperatures also mean that malaria, dengue fever, Lyme disease, and many other diseases that are caused by insects or parasites are spreading further and faster than they have ever done before. Food shortages and crop failures are increasing as rainfall becomes unpredictable. Sometimes not enough, but sometimes too much. Safe and reliable sources of water either dry up due to drought or become contaminated because of flooding. Wars are already being fought over access to water, and this is likely to increase. And because of the rapid changing climates, many indigenous plants and animals around the world are being threatened. The Bible tells us that God created all things and that God's creation, the natural environment, and all its ecosystems is a good thing. Humans are not separate, but part of that creation. And while all things are created by God and belong to God, God has entrusted the care of creation to us. The relationship between humans and the rest of creation is therefore one of interdependence and stewardship. We are creatures shaped by the same processes and dependent upon the same systems as all other parts of creation. Yet as God's stewards, we bear an ethical responsibility to care for the earth, its welfare, and all living things. As we gather in worship, we offer our gratitude and praise for God's creative power, for God's mercy and grace, for God's love and justice, all of which are evident in creation. We are filled with awe and wonder when we think about the beauty and diversity of creation. We are sustained, satisfied, 
and renewed by all that creation provides. We are amazed by what science reveals about the structures, systems, and interconnections of creation. And we are awed by the miracle of life that continues to unfold day by day. But we must also acknowledge that we humans have often denied our interdependence with creation and have failed to live up to our responsibility of stewardship and care. One major result is the global environmental degradation and climate change that we now face. Overwhelming scientific evidence shows that humans have caused a large part of global warming that occurs today. Climate change is one of the most significant threats to not only the natural world, but also our economic and social lives. I've mentioned several times before that material on which this series of sermons has been based was produced by the Anglican Church of South Africa in 2008. One startling and perhaps frightening comment in the material provided for this week says this. Unless we start meaningful reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions by 2015, global warming could become unstoppable. 2015. Well, we're long past that. And many scientists today believe that we have already reached the point of no return. Some believe that there is nothing we can do at this point to save our world and that our world will eventually be unable to support life. But we are a people of resurrection. We are a people of hope. We are a people who believe that things the world tells us are impossible can sometimes actually happen. But faith alone is not enough. The author of the letter to James, of James, puts it this way. Show me how anyone can have faith without action. I will show you my faith by my action. It is by our actions that we are put right with God and not our faith alone. So then, just as the body without the spirit is dead, faith without action is also dead. It is not enough for us to lament the past and to acknowledge the damage that has been done already. It's not enough for us to pray that God will fix everything and save our world. If we truly believe that there is hope for our world, and if we truly believe that we are called to be stewards of this world, then we must act. I want to end with that same quote I began with by the American environmentalist Bill McKibben. I've mostly given up on optimism or pessimism. Our odds of success are not incredibly good. But I wake up each morning saying, what can I do to change those odds a little. 
it's not impossible. The task that we have ahead of us. We're not going to stop global warming, but slowing it to the point where we can cope with it remains within the realm of possibility. Fun is not quite the right word, but there is something deeply satisfying about trying. It's exciting to be part of that, to be doing something that crucial is a great honor. I would add to what McKibben says that this is also a great responsibility, a great calling, a great challenge, and a great blessing offered to us by our great and wondrous creator with whom even the impossible just might sometimes happen. Amen. Hear the earth mourning deep in pollution. Hear the earth mourning deep in her lungs. How I keep longing for that first morning when all creation broke forth in song. Hear the trees falling deep in the forest. Hear the trees calling, tortured by chain. Where are the songbirds, thousands of voices, rising in one symphonic refrain? Hear the blood crying. Crying for justice, hear the blood crying deep in the ground. Massacres, murders, species forgotten. Where is the healing? Where is it found? Hear the land wailing deep in the dark. Hear the land wailing, crying in pain. Where are my children, torn from their homelands? Children, my children, come home again. Hear the man crying, crucified, dying. Hear the man crying, gasping for breath. I'll share your suffering, I'll share your bleeding. I'll bring you healing, even in death. I want to answer to um, just say once more, all of the songs that David has been singing throughout our season of creation were written by Norman Habel, written the words written and put to familiar tunes. So let us take a moment now to think about all the gifts with which we have been blessed. Gifts that enrich our lives in ways that sometimes we don't even realize. And let us think about the ways we use those gifts to enrich the lives of others. Let us pray. Divine One, 
we do not always appreciate the gifts we are given. We do not always use them wisely. We ask your blessing today on the gifts we give. May they be used wisely and lovingly for the good of all those who are part of your beautiful creation. Amen. And now let us take a moment of silence to offer our personal prayers for all those named in our prayer jar and all those who are in our thoughts and in our hearts. Amen. And we have a minute for mission. Sharing Circle lifts Indigenous voices. Our guests from Mission Service support community ministries as well as healing fund projects like the weekly Sharing Circle at St. Matthew's Maryland. This community ministry offers health and wellness programs to meet basic needs and help families thrive. One of the programs is a weekly Sharing Circle led by an Indigenous knowledge keeper followed by a simple lunch. One participant described her experience there. The elder opened the sharing circle with a prayer and lit some sage, one of the traditional medicines used by indigenous peoples. When sage is burned, the smoke cleanses a person's body, mind and spirit so they can put aside their worries and be present. Also, it is believed that smoke can carry a person's prayers to the Creator. Once the circle opened, we all took turns sharing anything we wanted. The elder taught us about the Anishabup creation story, and later we talked about what we learned. After the sharing circle, we had lunch. The Banuk was delicious. I was happy to chat with one of the Indigenous participants who was a long way from home on the west coast of British Columbia. She first came to St. Matthew's, Maryland three years ago looking for her services, and the warm reception encouraged her to return for programming. Eventually, she started to volunteer and build her confidence as a helper. I was grateful to them for providing such a safe place for participants, participants to build relationships, learn about health issues, and support their goals for health and wellness. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of mission and service. I want to share a prayer today with you that was written by Brian Day of Salt Spring Island, BC. Let us pray. 
God of creation. We come to you in praise for the marvels and wonders of this world, for its magnificent creatures, its intricate systems, for all that has emerged through the long, great history of creation. And we come to you in lament for the destruction of the world, for the thinning of its plants and animals, for the heating and the poisoning of its land and water and air. We come to you suspended between creation and destruction, holding at once to praise and lament. May we share your joy and your grief in this world. May we recognize and listen to the prophets of our day. And may we turn our hands towards the work that is given to this generation. Open our hearts to the time in which we live. May we have the courage to face our despair, our sense of helplessness, our wish to turn away from all that we would rather not notice. Open our hearts to sorrow and to hope, to all that love and creation calls us to be a part of. Stir us to act as your presence in the world, to be faithful to this earth and to all our relations, to live in accord with you and your creation and with your great unquenchable thirst for life. Blessed be. Amen. Lord of suns and stars exploding, galaxies and swirling skies, where you chose to show your glory, took the heavens by surprise. Lord of solar winds and wisdom, superstars that blow our mind. Choosing such a fragile planet hardly seems a grand design. On this piece of stardust swirling, on this spinning dot in space, life itself was born like music when you showed your hidden face. What an honor to be chosen, silent planet, blue and green, filled with glory, grace and gardens, where the breath of God is seen. What is even more amazing, we have poison and earth like fools, Help us change our way of living, love the earth and love her rules. Help us stem the tide of traitors, leaving earth an empty store. Join us now, Creator Spirit, come renew your earth once more.
So now, go out from here into all the wonder of creation of which you are a part. But do not go in fear and desperation. Go in hope. For where God is, there is always hope. Go in love, knowing that because you are loved, you can freely love in return. Go in joy, believing that you were created to live joyfully as part of creation. Go in faith, determined to do your part to make a difference in the world and determined to live in hope, love, and joy with your divine creator. Go with God. <laughs>